Ah. So, I call this talk the primacy of consciousness. And I want to go further than a number of speakers have gone here at this conference, not only to show that consciousness is absolutely fundamental, but there is only consciousness, despite what you see. So I want to start with what the Science Journal, a few years ago on their 125th anniversary, said there are they looked at the 25 unanswered questions of modern science. And number one was, what is the universe made of? And the answer is, today, we have absolutely no idea. <laughs> science is actually in a crisis. We have lots of experiments, lots of data, lots of funny things happening, and no one knows what's going on. And we have lots of theories. We have, you know, what a... What's the universe made of? Is it made of quarks and gluons and things? Or is it, you know, other elementary particles? Is it strings? Is it quantum loops? Is it M theory? Is there dark matter out there or not? Is there dark energy? We have all these different theories, and they all explain bits of it, but none of them explain all of it. And this is the first time in history we've been in this situation where we have all these unknowns and no, and no real competing theory. The second unanswered question is, what is the biological basis of consciousness? And again, we have lots of theories about how does consciousness arise from the brain, does it arise from the brain, all these different ideas, and we're still at a complete loss. And I think part of the reason is we are looking at it from totally the wrong perspective. Now, I just want to briefly cover the two major evolutions of modern physics in the last century. The first was the theory of relativity, which showed, first of all, something we all know, math and energy, mass and energy are equivalent, that famous equation. Here it's ohm equals mc squared, but Einstein said e equals mc squared. Energy and matter are equivalent and, in a way, interchangeable, and space and time are relative and also interchangeable. And I just put the equation up there because people don't, just to see the similarity between energy and matter, the equation, and the equation between space and time. And C represents the speed of light. And we're discovering something fascinating that the speed of light, or light itself, seems to be absolute and actually more fundamental than matter, energy, space, or time. The second great revolution was, of course, quantum theory, and we've been looking at a lot here. And some of the challenges there were, first of all, wave-particle complementarity, which a number of speakers have looked at, the double-slit experiment. Then there's the collapse of the wave function speakers have spoken about when you... Something is just in a probable state until you actually observe it, and then one of the infinite number of probabilities, or thousands of probabilities, suddenly comes into existence when you observe it. And there's the uncertainty principle that says even when you do observe it, you can't know everything about it. If you measure a particle's momentum, measure its speed, you don't actually know where it is. If you measure where it is, you don't know how fast it's going. If you measure its energy, you can't actually tell when you measured its energy. If you measure when it is, you don't know what its energy is within certain limits. All weird. And then there's entanglement, which we... If you don't know what entanglement is by now, <laughs> you must have just arrived. And what's fascinating about these is they're showing two things, these two revolutions. First, that science, ma sorry, space, time, matter, energy aren't absolute. There's no fixed material world, physical world, which was one of the great shocks. And the second thing is that consciousness, observation, knowing play a crucial role in it somehow. But what we're trying to do is these two great revolutions pointed to something profound. There's no, doesn't seem there's a material, physical world like we thought there is, and consciousness is somehow deeply involved. And yet nearly all the ways we're trying to understand these phenomena is we're trying to understand them within a mindset that thinks there is a material, that there is a material world, and from a paradigm that says consciousness isn't really important. And to me, this is no wonder we're not getting anywhere. 
they're pointing to a completely new way of looking at the world, and we're still stuck in a sort of pre-20th century way of thinking, and we can't quite bear to imagine what the world might be like if we really took these implications seriously. Which is why Richard Feynman said, nobody understands quantum physics. And I think he's right. I don't think anybody will understand quantum physics and still we, until we start including consciousness within the equation. So, I want to look at a couple of things. First of all, what do we mean by reality? Because we use reality in two senses. Either there's the physical reality, the world out there, the world you're seeing now, or so it seems, and then there's the experience reality that appears in consciousness. And that's what you're actually experiencing, is not the room out there, you're experiencing what appears in consciousness. And so we use reality in both these ways. And what's happening, and we, this is, we all know this, in fact this is one of the things that science or psychology, neurophysiology, fully understands, but it doesn't actually think, of, think it through the implications. What we know is that the world out there, whatever it is, and we'll look at that in a moment, gets processed by the brain, and we have this experience of seeing, hearing, tasting, touching the world out there. But we're actually living in a virtual reality created by the brain. It's a very good one, it's a pretty accurate one, it allows us to navigate around. This is where I think, you know, when I reach out to touch this, is it is where I see it. But we're actually living in a reality created by the brain. And so as well as being an information processor, we can say the brain is actually a reality generator, continually generating experience for us. And so what we actually see are representations of the world out there. We don't actually see the world out there. We're we seeing representations of it that the brain's created. So all that we ever know of the world is actually an inference from experience. And, and this is really important, because we, th we think we're seeing the world out there, we make all these um, statements about it, and what science is trying to do, the goal of science is to understand what the world out there is like, how it functions. And we're doing all of this from taking data from our actual experience and projecting it out onto the world out there. And it's all to do with, again, with knowing. And it's interesting, the word science comes from the Latin scire, to know, and the word consciousness comes from the Latin scire. It means to know with, conscire, consciousness. So the science looks at what is known, and consciousness is what we know with. It's that we know with our consciousness. Our knowing takes place in consciousness. Now, the problem with all this is we imagine that the world out there is just like our experience of it. So, you know, right now there's, you know, there's green leaves over there. There's actually no green over there. There's something over there which sends off light of a certain energy, a certain wavelength, which is just another concept in the mind. And that light hits my eye, the retina, sends impulses down to the brain, but they're not green impulses, there's nothing green about it. The brain processes it and comes up, for me, with the experience of green. But the greenness is only in my experience, it's not out there. And that's the same with everything. If I'm smelling a flower, the flower itself doesn't smell. It sends out molecules which touch my nose and the brain creates this reality of the aroma of a, of a flower. But it's only in the mind. Or you're hearing my voice. But what's actually happening is air molecules, whatever they are, are moving backwards and forwards and hitting your eardrum and hitting little hairs there which process it and create the experience of you hearing my voice. But it's all only in the mind. And so the philosopher Whitehead put this very clearly, said, 
the mind experiences qualities which are purely offspring of the mind alone. So we, we, this is the virtual reality we live in. In fact, one of my lovely quotes I found recently from Isaac Newton, now we're going back 300 years, and he saw this, he said, colors are not in the physical world, they're only wavelengths and reflectances. Color is absolutely a product of our mind. And I think it's fascinating, you know, we're talking about this now, but he saw this hundreds of years ago. So what's really happening is something's going on, but we don't know what, what is out there. We actually don't. It's all just inferences. And it turns out, really, it's nothing like it. And what we have, what we're experiencing, is like a map of the world. And you've often heard this idea that the map is not the territory. In fact, they're usually totally different. If you look at a map of you know, a country or something, you see you know, green lines representing something, blue lines are certain roads, red roads are other roads. You go there, and you say, well, hang, hang on, the roads aren't red. They all seem to be a sort of gray color. It's like no, the, map, the map is very different. The map is a representation. And it's like we live inside the map that we make of the world. But what the world is like, we actually have no idea. And it's not only true that of color and all these things, but what we think of matter doesn't actually exist. And we used to think matter was composed of atoms. That's the old Greek idea, these little tiny solid balls of matter, which is again just an idea taken from experience. We, we see solid things, so we imagine matter is solid. And then 100, 150 years ago, we realized that atoms were composed of subatomic particles. And then a bit later, we realized it was mostly empty space. If you take the nucleus of an atom and put it you know, as a golf ball inside this room, that's the nucleus, electrons would be spinning around outside this room. So that's the amount of empty space, a golf ball in the middle, electrons spinning around outside. It's, the actual calculation is something like 99.9999999% empty space. And then what we discover is, more, in more modern times with quantum physics, that even the protons, neutrons, electrons, they don't actually exist. We think of them as particles. We call them elementary particles. They're not particles at all. We don't know what they are. There's, we really don't know. All we know is that we get certain results from certain experiments, and we call them particles, but really there seems to be nothing there. Or, as I like to rephrase it, there's no thing there. That thingness is really a construct in the mind. There's no thing there. There's something's going on which gives rise to our experience, but whatever's going on is nothing like it, nothing like our experience. Matter is not made of matter, said Hans Peter Dürer recently. Matter as we know it exists only in the mind. So, is there anything we can say about the world out there? Anything at all? And I think there's several things, and that's where I want to go with this. First is, it's not homogeneous, which means it's, it's not all the same. By which I mean, whatever my finger is, somehow is different from the air next to it. It's structured differently. Whatever, you know, whatever an electron is, is somehow different from a proton. We don't know what they are, but the structure there in the world, there's variations. So we have a world where there's a lot going on, but there's a lot of complex structure and variation. And the second thing we know about it is that this structure and variation changes over time. You know, my finger was here a moment ago, now it's over here, so the structure of the universe changed over a few seconds. It's, it's always, always changing, unfolding. So all that we can say is there's, I think all we can say is there's a dynamic, meaning it's changing, a dynamic, structured field of being. And I use the word being because it's the most neutral word I think we can find for this. I mean, it literally means what is. Being is just is. It's just isness. I don't want to give it any other qualities other than just to say it is. It's a field of being of some, some form. And 
in a way, all we can say out there, and a number of physicists are coming to this, there is information. That's all we know, there's information. An electron is just information. It has something we call mass. It's just a number. It's a bit of information. It has something we call charge. We don't know what that really is, but it's another bit of information. It has something we call spin. Again, we call it spin. We don't know what it is. It's not actually spinning. It's just information. And that's why mathematics is really the tool of physics, because it's, it's the tool with which we can analyze, model the information, find out how the information is interacting with itself. And what happens when we perceive something is our senses respond to the information, whether it's coming in through the eyes, the ears, whatever, our senses respond to the information and then corresponding patterns of information arise in the brain. I say corresponding, you know, the information in the brain is structured very differently, but when I, when I see this room, there's a pattern of information in my visual cortex which radiates out into the rest of the brain, and that pattern of information somehow correlates with the information out there. And then that information is expressed as the forms in the mind, the shapes, the colors, whatever it is I see. So I like to say experience is an informing of consciousness, deliberately with two meanings. It's the information from there is coming into consciousness and is then being represented as the material world. So it's an informing of consciousness in terms of information, but that's where the form appears. The form appears in consciousness. So the material world, that what we call the material world, is actually just the appearance in the mind. So the second thing I want to look at, the other question, what is the biological basis of consciousness? Which brings us to the whole, this was the second question that they posed to the top 25 unanswered questions. The basic assumption is that the brain is somehow involved. And clearly the brain is involved in how, what we experience. You know, if I cut out half my visual cortex, I won't see the world the same way. Cut out other parts, parts are damaged, we don't experience it. Clearly the brain is involved in the processing of information and generating the realities that appear in consciousness. But that's a very different question from does the brain generate the capacity for experience? And a lot of people in the sort of scientific world confuse these two questions. They conflate them and think it's the same question. And that's why they say, oh, the brain must create consciousness because we damage the brain or we give you an anesthetic, the consciousness goes. So the brain must be creating consciousness. All we know is the brain affects what appears in consciousness. Whether it creates consciousness is a whole different question. And this is what's called the hard problem in philosophy or psychology. David Chalmers called it the hard problem. How does something as immaterial as consciousness, it's not itself material consciousness, how does that arise from something as unconscious as matter? It's like why we assume the brain is made of matter, brain cells which aren't conscious. How on earth does consciousness come out of that? It's like something magic is going on. We have something totally unconscious producing consciousness. And most of the scientific world is stuck in this idea of trying to explain it. Lots of different ideas, nothing works. And there's a second problem with this whole approach, is if, if consciousness arises out of matter, where do you draw the line? Which I mean, you know, human beings, we know we're conscious. We assume dogs are conscious. I sometimes meet people who say, oh, I actually meet people who say human beings aren't conscious. I find them fascinating and most, <laughs> most frustrating people to have a conversation with. They say, oh, this all may be an illusion. Okay, if it's an illusion, who's experiencing the illusion? Oh, that may be an okay. you know, you know. Others say, oh, animals aren't conscious. And my retort is, well, if, you, if your dog had to go for an operation, would you ask the vet to give it an anesthetic? And they say, well, of course. It's like, well, if you don't believe it's conscious, why would you want to make it unconscious? You know, clearly, we imagine a dog would feel pain or our cat would feel pain. So clearly, we think they're conscious, they're experiencing. 
Do we draw the line between dogs and fish? I mean, fish have similar nervous systems. We imagine they would be conscious. I mean, I think most of us would have a hard time sort of catching a fish and just cutting it to bits while it was still alive to eat it. We want to, we want to make sure it's dead and unconscious before we start mutilating it. So this question, where do you draw the line? And the problem is, wherever you draw the line, you come up against the same question of how does something below the line is totally unconscious, what happens above the line that becomes conscious? So some people say, you know, nervous systems are important. Jellyfish don't have nervous systems. But does that mean they're not conscious? Or is it just the nervous system allows their consciousness to take a much richer form? If, if you say a jellyfish is totally unconscious, you have to explain what it is about nerve cells that actually creates the appearance of consciousness. And no one has any idea. So where people are going is to say there is no line. Bacteria have some dim, 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 very faint hint of consciousness. And you have to then go down to matter and say you cannot draw the line anywhere. So in that sense, consciousness is in everything. And if you take that position, then you say, well, there's no line between an atom and the quantum field that seems to be manifesting as an atom. And you have to say it goes all the way into the nothingness, into the no-thingness. The awareness has to go all the way down. It's not something that appears in evolution. It's something which was pre-existing. And that's what's called panpsychism in philosophy, which literally means mind in all. So the idea is that consciousness goes all the way down. And this is, I think, I call the meta-paradigm the paradigm behind the paradigms. The current meta-paradigm is the real world is the material world. Space, time, matter, energy are primary. Consciousness is an epiphenomenon of matter. With paradigms, like um, the idea that the Earth, when the Earth was still at the center of the universe, there's an anomalies. An anomaly is something which troubles the paradigm. It's something which can't be explained. And the anomaly for the current worldview is consciousness itself. Consciousness, it, we cannot doubt it. There's absolutely no doubting that we are conscious. It's the only thing we're absolutely sure of. And there's no way of explaining it. And the fundamental assumption that is the problem here, the unquestioned assumption of the current meta-paradigm, is that matter is insentient. So where we're going is towards a new worldview which says, and this is what people here have been speaking about, the alternative meta-paradigm is that consciousness is a fundamental quality of the cosmos as fundamental as space, time, matter, energy. But I want to go a step further. This is, this is like a halfway point, although we're nearly at the end of the talk, it's a halfway point in our understanding. It's actually more fundamental. And what I want to say, is there anything else we can say about the world out there? If consciousness goes all the way down, then we can say there is awareness there. There is awareness. So we end up with a view saying there's a dynamic, structured field of being that is aware. And one of the problems with panpsychism is that it's still a dualistic model. It's dual aspect. It says everything in the physical world has a mental aspect. So there's two aspects. It's, it's still a dualistic model. But then we, we say everything, but is there really anything there? And this, is, again, is a fundamental assumption of modern science, that there is some, something there in some form or another. But I think we need to question that assumption. I mean, the assumption is there is some physical reality in some way or other. But if there's nothing there, no thing, and thingness is just a construct in the mind, maybe we have to let go of that fundamental assumption. And I want to bring in here Occam with his razor, which has nothing to do with shaving, although it looks like he needed one. His idea, this was way back, is among, when you have competing hypotheses, the one with the least number of assumptions is probably the right one. 
So if we're looking at the cosmos and say, is it, is it a dual thing? There's something called a unified field out of which, or part of which is consciousness, has two assumptions. If everything is pointing to the fact there may be no thing there, maybe we should drop that assumption and just say the, the model that's probably the more correct one is the one that says there's only awareness there. There is only an aware field of being, a field of pure consciousness, we can call it spirit, Brahman, God. And that, we say the universe is a dynamic structured field of being observing itself and in observing itself, creating, its, creating for itself a representation of the world as a material world. In, the, in this new model, consciousness is not an epiphenomenon of matter. Matter is an epiphenomenon of consciousness. Now, just briefly, new paradigms usually have a couple of things about them. First of all, they include the existing paradigm as a model that's true. And secondly, they explain the anomaly and other problems. I just want to very briefly look at how I think this idea that the universe is only consciousness, how, how it, what the new paradigm looks like. So firstly, the laws of physics are still valid. Everything we've discovered about the world is still valid. I want to you know, put that up as a big banner. Do not worry. We're not changing anything that we've discovered. But we have to change what we think about them. We assume that they're the laws of the unfolding of the physical world of space, time, and matter, but really they're the laws of the unfolding of consciousness. And so this answers the science journal's top two questions. What is the universe made of? Nothing. It's not made of anything. But there is this aware field of being. What is the biological basis of consciousness? We don't need one. The consciousness is already there. Then, secondly, this may offer new approaches to understanding quantum theory, as I said at the beginning. There's no fixed material world, and consciousness is important. This is a model which satisfies those two. We don't, we don't know how it works out, but clearly it's relevant to that. Secondly, paranormal phenomena aren't prohibited anymore. Paranormal phenomena are prohibited in modern science because there's no way of explaining. If everything's consciousness, then all this stuff becomes allowable. We may not understand it, but it's allowable. And thirdly, it offers a bridge between science and spirituality. And the essence of spirituality, as we've been touching upon here, is the whole nature of I, of I am. And if it's a field of being, I am is actually the first person experience of being. Being is what is, but when we experience what is as conscious beings, it's the essence is amness. And this is what, just a couple of, you know, Ramana Maharshi, I am is the name of God. If God is the essence of creation, the essence of creation as experienced is the self. Or Schrodinger. The physicist, what is this I? You will on close introspection, not analysis, introspection, looking at yourself, find what you really mean by I is the ground stuff upon which all experiences and memories are collected. Finally, and this is important, but why don't we see everything as this? Why do we see a material world that's devoid of consciousness? We don't see consciousness here. Why does all this appear devoid of consciousness? Because if we, if we say everything's consciousness, it clearly doesn't look like that. And the reason is, comes back to the, the map and the territory idea. What is out there is the dynamic, structured, aware field. Here is the representation inside us. What we see are the shapes, colors, forms. But consciousness is not part of the map. It's like if you, you know, if you look at a map and you ask, where am I? All you see is a little arrow saying, you are here, pointing to where you are in the map. And it's the same with consciousness. We create this whole representation of the world and the representation doesn't have consciousness represented within it. And then you have this little arrow saying, consciousness is here. This little point in the map, in the center of the map is where consciousness is. And we don't see that the whole map is actually an appearance in consciousness, 
but it doesn't itself contain consciousness in the representation. It's a bit like looking at, you know, you look at a movie and you realize the movie's made of light and you then start examining the movie to see where the light comes from. You'll never find it. So we perceive an unconscious material world and wonder where consciousness comes from. And this is why the hard problem arises in the first place. So let me just finish with a few just quotes from scientists, mystics. This is Eddington. Physics is the study of the structure of consciousness. The stuff of the world is mind stuff. This is a hundred years ago. One of the great scientists in relativity followed Einstein. Another great scientists at that time, physicists, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. It's a better book of the great liberation. Matter derives from mind, not mind from matter. It is not so much that you are in the cosmos as that the whole cosmos is in you. The whole cosmos is, in, is the manifestation within our own personal reality as we know it. And of course the person who started this conference off Nisargadatta said it probably the most accurately. The world you perceive is made of consciousness. What you call matter is consciousness itself. So, thank you. Hmm? Yes. I know we're, the whole session's running late, but we can take a couple of questions. Thank you, Beth. Um, I think that was really quite beautiful. Okay. So the question is that. We're not. Mm -hmm. And everything, therefore, is in alignment with the light, which is in the immovable at that point. Then, I know, you just project through this. You got two now. I two. <laughs> Stereo. Oh, my God. Then, what's all the mental masturbation about? What's all the what about? Mental masturbation about. If everything is light yeah, and everything that. is consciousness, then yeah. what's all the talk about? Why do we then have to fight about it, go to war about it, have to spend treaties about it, arguing about it, nine million theosophies about it? Why do we masturbate over it? Well, two levels of answer to that question. One, one, not everybody realizes that. And even when we do realize it, we're not living it. You know, that's what we're talking about, awakening. Or, what's the purpose of the not awakening? That's what? The I, there must be a purpose in the non-awakening itself. Okay. Right? Um, no. Okay, because... I don't, well, yes and no. Okay. If, yes and no, or, or neither yes nor no, if you want to take... Or Mag both. Mag Magajuna. I see it as, yes, there's a, there's a purpose to the, in the awakening, to awaken. Why are we not awakened in the first place? I think that we see the evolution of this field of being. It evolves into more and more complex forms... Yes. And as those forms get more complex, so the consciousness gets more complex. And there comes a point with beings like us where the consciousness becomes reflective and actually recognizes it is conscious. And that's the first stage of awakening. We call it self-reflective consciousness. Oh, I am conscious. And then, oh, well, who is the I that's conscious? Oh, here, there's me. This I lives in a body inside my head. And we fall into a whole ego mode of operating in the world, which is a halfway stage of awakening. And then full awakening is beginning to see that is just another arising in consciousness. But it's that ego mode which gets us then trapped into looking for this, conflicting with the world, fighting each other, fighting ourselves. So I see it as part of the process of awakening to the full discovery of recognizing that everything is consciousness. So I see it's part of an evolutionary unfolding. So it's how consciousness becomes conscious of itself. Yeah, yeah. We are the universe's way of recognizing there is only consciousness. Yeah. Russell. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, a question uh, 
where did this all begin? That is, is there consciousness that comes out of the Big Bang or is there consciousness before the Big Bang that always existed? And the other part of the same question is, this sounds an awful lot like the world is made of God. That is, uh, panpsychism sounds like a theory that consciousness fills the universe and there is no way to either verify that or contradict it. I'm mm -hmm. sure you're familiar with that idea. Yeah, yeah. So, so it troubles me as a, as a scientist to say, I understand the idea that you're proposing, it's an interesting idea, but how can I determine whether it's true or not? I'm not sure. Um, I think, I mean, your first, let's take the first question. I mean, first of all, the Big Bang is just an idea we have. It's just a current idea in the mind about how the universe began. But who knows what really happened? But if there was some, there was some beginning, what I'm saying is what we call the matter energy of the Big Bang is just another form that awareness was taking on, which we call energy, matter, space, and time. They're all forms that the field is taking on. And so the... I mean, to put it another way, you know, people have been talking about you know, the quantum field and consciousness being part of the quantum field. I'm saying no. The quantum field is a manifestation of consciousness. It is how consciousness begins to manifest is what we call the quantum field. So it, everything is ultimately an aware field. You can call it, yes, we can call it God, whatever. So you would say it's, ob it's obvious that consciousness is primary and Big Bang Big bangs come and go, and consciousness is the ground of all being. Yes, yes. I think, as I say, it's not a question of is this provable. But if we take this, if we take this view, does it then allow us to have a completely new way of looking at quantum physics, which might actually start making more sense? Okay, one more. So I know lunch is waiting. Thank you, Peter. Does there exist yet a journal that comes from the point of view of a primacy of consciousness and how that may be changing our notions of science? So, what was the first, John? What, that, does, does a journal yet exist to ah. bring together those of you who come from the notion or the, of the primacy of consciousness? I don't think so. Should do. I'm, I can't recall one. I don't think so. There's the, there are journals around consciousness, Journal of Consciousness Studies, things like this, but they tend to be still a very strong rooting in the traditional scientific material world. Yeah. So, time, whatever it is, calls. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.